You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Good morning, everyone. My name is Colin. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 24. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way and everywhere we accept this with gratitude. But to detain detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly, for we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also join in the charge, affirming that all of these things were so. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God which this man themselves accept, that there will be resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and men. Now after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple, without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation should they have anything against me. Or else let these men say them let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them. It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When this year the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. And after some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. These are the true words of the living God. Good morning, everyone. This won't do. There we go. Thank you. Much better. Good morning. My name is Trent. Um, I'm here preaching to you this morning in absence of Perch. Perch is in Japan, so I will be freeing you from the South African accent for one week. Um, I'm actually here to do two things this morning. I'm here to preach to you, as you might expect, and I'm also here to make a confession. I have a confession to my physiotherapist. My physio, Vong, goes to ECP. Um, now, uh, Vong has been a good friend of mine for many years. I've been seeing Vong for many years as well for my, my back. I have a bad back. Um, and the other day, uh, actually a few, a few months ago, I was preaching up here one Sunday, 
And the following week, I went into my appointment with Vong, and he, he pulled out his phone, and he showed me a picture on his phone. And, and I looked at it from a bit, of a bit of a distance, and what I could see was kind of this side profile picture of what, what looked to be some disfigured character. And I looked a little closer, and I thought, okay, that looks like a picture of the hunchback of Notre Dame. And then a little closer, and it was me. It was me. So I clearly have uh, some, some issues with my back. Vong was trying to point out to me that I need to, to stand up straight so you all can keep me honest today. Um, but Vong has also assured me that I don't have anything structurally wrong with my back. It's just that um, I've kind of uh, uh, taught my back it's the wrong things over the years. And I need to do some exercises to retrain the muscles, right? So here's where the confession comes in. And I'm going to say this to Vong. Vong, I'm so sorry but I don't do my exercises. <laughs> I, I want to do my exercises, but the problem is that I want to do other things more than I want to do my exercises, right? It's not good. But isn't that often the case? There are things in our life that we see very clearly. There is some truth that we know, and there's some response that we should have, and yet we don't respond in the way that we're supposed to. And that's what I want to show us today with this passage. I think in this passage today, there are varying responses to a truth. And I want to pull out three themes. The first one, these are my three points, is Paul's persistence in the gospel. And the second one is the gospel's persistence in Felix. And the third, response to the resurrection. And let me give you some background on the, book of, on the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a historical record of the launch and spread of the Christian movement from Jerusalem to Rome in the first century AD. This, of course, is in response to this widespread news of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, besides Paul, or sorry, besides Jesus, Paul is the most prominent character in the book of Acts. Um, and in our previous chapters, he has spent many years spreading the news of uh, the gospel throughout the Mediterranean and the Middle East. And when we say the gospel, what we really mean is the good news that God saves sinners through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And today, um, although the gospel represents many things, many of the wonderful truths about what Jesus has done for us and is continuing to do for us, when I say the gospel today, I do want you to have the resurrection of Jesus at the forefront of your mind. So Paul is preaching this gospel throughout these regions, and it all comes to a screeching halt when Paul comes back to Jerusalem because he's there to uh, give donations to the church, the struggling church in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and the Jews in Jerusalem, who are stirred up by these other Jews from other parts of Asia that have come from the regions where Paul was, they are all trying to kill Paul. They do not like what Paul is preaching. Now, Paul had to be saved by the Roman military, not because they cared about him, but because they're trying to maintain peace and order in the lands. And up to this point, his life has actually been threatened multiple times, including in our last chapter, which we went through last week, where there's been an assassination attempt against Paul. Now, the Romans, they don't know what to do with Paul, and so they incarcerate him. They, they have him in captivity. And they deliver him then to the Roman governor, Felix, who's in charge of Judea and Samaria, that region. And he's residing in Caesarea. And this is where our passage here today takes place. Our passage today is going to be the closest thing that Paul has to a legitimate trial. And this is how it all goes. This is my first point, Paul's persistence in the gospel. It's the case of the Jews v. Paul. And the Jews are serious about silencing Paul, and so they hire an outside lawyer named Tertullus to try their case. And he accuses Paul of three things. Number one, he says that Paul is a plague and that he's inciting riots in Jerusalem. And this is a serious thing to the Romans, because again, the Romans want to maintain peace and order. The second thing is that he is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, ringleader is not a very nice way of saying that Paul is a church leader, and the sect of the Nazarenes is a less flattering way of referring to the Christians. And the third thing, they say, is that he is a profaner of the temple, meaning that he's a threat to the Jewish religion, which is not good because the Jews are a significant population in Jerusalem and important to maintaining order in Jerusalem as well. So these are the three things. Now, it's important to highlight that this case against Paul 
is a total sham. It's a complete mockery. Paul is completely innocent of any wrongdoing, legally and morally. And the violence that the Jews have enacted against Paul is far worse than anything that Paul has done. Actually, Paul should be the victim here. And Tertullus, beyond this, lays out no evidence in his case. No evidence whatsoever. I don't know if there's any lawyers in the room, but I don't think that's a good sign. Do you ever Google something um, really, really obvious and stupid? I Googled this. I asked Google, can you win a case with no evidence? And it said, most certainly not. That was its response, most certainly not. So all this, and then not to mention, his accusers aren't even there for the trial. It says this in verses 18 and 19. Paul realizes this mid-sentence, and he says they ought to be here. By Roman law and practices, that alone would have been enough for the trial to be thrown out. But it's not. It goes on. It's an injustice, this whole thing. So imagine, for a moment, putting yourself in Paul's shoes. You stand before a Singapore court. You're wrongfully accused. Your accuser doesn't even bother to show up. And you're totally misunderstood and hated by the people that are there. How does Paul respond to this? Cheerfully. Cheerful. In verse 10, he says, I cheerfully make my defense. And factually, so his response is cheerful and it's factual. In verse 11, he says, you can verify. And in verse 13, he says, neither can you prove. To sum it up, he's saying, you can verify that I was not inciting riots or profaning the temple, and neither can they prove that I was. However, there is one confession here. And I wonder if everyone in the room inched forward a little bit on their seats, inched to the edge of their seats when Paul said, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Now, according to the way, what does that mean? Well, that's Paul's way of saying I'm a Christian. The way was a term used for Christians in that time. It meant um, the, uh, that Jesus was the way to God. He was the way to salvation. He was the way of life. Jesus is the way. And that's what he's saying. So Paul gladly admits to this second accusation and makes then his faith in Christ and his hope in the resurrection the focus of his speech. And not just here, but later, uh, when he has this personal audience with Felix, the one man that can free him from this situation, what does he choose to talk about? Faith in Christ and the resurrection. This is almost, almost frustrating, isn't it? it? It would have been so easy for Paul to just stick to the facts and to just plead his innocence, and maybe they would have let him go. That's what any rational person would do, right? And I think oftentimes that's what we do. Right? When we experience injustice in our lives or when we're faced with accusations that are unfair, we focus on the facts and we plead our case. We've got one life to live, right? So we need to look out for number one. And as Christians even, we might even be tempted to act as if our faith isn't relevant to this injustice that we're experiencing. Sometimes we treat it as if the, our faith is a secondary issue. My manager unfairly critiques my work. My kids accuse me of being a bad parent. My wife or my husband is never appreciative of my contributions to the marriage. So let me fight back first and then later I'll focus on my faith when it becomes relevant again. Or if we're being totally honest with ourselves as Christians, we might even pick and choose the aspects of Christianity that help us to plead our case. Let me find the place in the Bible that shows that I'm right and shows how wrong they are. But Paul doesn't seem to care much for his own self-interest here, does he? He doesn't weaponize God against these people for his own purposes. The truth about the resurrection is what he talks about 
but that does nothing for his legal case. Yet it seems to be the content that he wants to keep coming back to. His words are cheerful, factual, and persistent in proclaiming the truths of Christianity above all else. So why is Paul doing this? Like what has gotten into Paul? How can he persist through such injustice? And for that matter, cheerfully. It seems a bit odd. Maybe the question we're asking is, how can we do this? I want to know what motivates this man. I'm, I'm, I, hopefully some of you want to know what motivates this man. Let's take a few steps back and let's talk about Paul. Let's talk about his background. For those who don't know, Paul is a man who made his introduction in the Bible as a murderer of Christians. Acts 8.3 says that he was ravaging the church. He is not the guy that you would expect to have a good standing before God. He is not the guy that you would expect to have a clear conscience. And yet at the beginning of chapter 23, and again here in verse 16, Paul speaks of his clear conscience before God. Now you might be thinking, how can someone like that have the audacity to say such a thing? And that's, that's how the Jews felt. When he said it back in chapter 23, they punched him in the face. Literally, it says they struck him across the mouth. So, again, let's talk a little bit more about Paul. Back in chapter 23, where this whole debate with the Jews began, Paul retells the story of his personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Jesus appeared to Paul in the midst of his ravaging of the church, and Jesus chooses Paul as his instrument to spread the news of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. Now, Paul puts his faith in this Jesus that he hated so much. Why does he do that? Well, it's because of this faith then that he, in his faith alone, that he is pardoned from all these horrendous acts that he perpetrated against the Christians. Paul was justified once and for all by the blood of Christ. This is the background of Paul's personal experience when he speaks of his faith and his hope in the resurrection. It's his motivation for responding in the way that he is. The resurrected Jesus is the foundation and proof upon which he can look backwards and forwards backwards to the grace that he has received and forwards with hope for the resurrection to come and the reality that he will spend eternity with Christ. Paul has total assurance that his conscience is clear before God because Jesus declared it so. And he can trust that these injustices that he is now facing will one day be made right by God through the resurrection. So Paul doesn't need to defend himself before these people or use his time with Felix to seek out his own freedom. Paul has resurrection courage. Paul has resurrection courage. And I will remind you, my friends, that we have access to these very same treasures. Paul's response can be our response. In the face of injustice, we too can choose to embody this message of grace and resurrection hope that we have received. We can embody this to those around us. It's worth considering what that looks like in your situation. Let me summarize my point with this. Paul persisted in proclaiming the gospel despite the injustices that he faced because the truth of the gospel persisted in him. Paul acted as a man that really believed in the grace and the hope of the resurrected Christ, and he thought it was worth sacrificing for. And we have access to the same thing. But this glorious gospel does not have the same effect on everyone. And this leads to my second point, the gospel's persistence in Felix. Now, we actually know quite a lot about this character, Felix. Historical records confirm that Antonius Felix was the Roman governor or procurator, as they called him, of Judea and Samaria from 52 AD to 60 AD. And secular history shows that Felix was a man who began his, uh, his life as a slave and was later freed and rose to great prominence. It's actually quite a story. 
But this history also shows that he was a man of greed and violence. He was known for corruption, brutal use of force, murdering his enemies, and most famously for assassinating the high priest of the Jews. And that's when he eventually, he actually got called back to Rome at that point. In the first century, Roman historian Tacitus recorded this about Felix. He said, Felix practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of king with all the instincts of a slave. Okay, so we have born a slave, later freed, rose to prominence, uses his evil for his own power and for his own uh, purposes, serves an emperor. I don't know if we have any Star Wars fans here, but this guy sounds like Darth Vader. He's Darth Vader, okay? And in verse 24, this is the man that Paul speaks, of, uh, speaks to about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. Is Paul insane? Is he insane? It feels like he's really poking the bear here. I wouldn't stand up to Darth Vader like this. But actually, according to Vong, I don't really stand up that properly in the first place. But um, ironically, though, Paul is not the scared one. Isn't that fascinating? Verse uh, Verse 25 says, Felix was alarmed and said to Paul, go away for the present when I get an opportunity I will summon you. So this same gospel message that has so transformed Paul brought so much alarm to Felix. For one man, it's his lifeblood. It's it's driving his whole existence. It's this seeming source of invincibility that he has. And for the other man, it brings about so much fear. Isn't that interesting? Such different responses to the same truth kind of like me and the person who actually does their physio exercises. Now, Felix doesn't sound to me like a man whose conscience was clear. And yet, the truth of the gospel is persistent. With Felix, the truth of the gospel is so counter to his way of life that it seems he can hardly bear it, and yet he keeps coming back to it again and again. It says he sent for Paul and conversed with him often. And this happened for two years Two years of this. Now, admittedly, the the passage also says that Felix hoped to receive money from Paul, but it it should be obvious that Paul was not going to give in to this kind of temptation. He already said in his defense that he gave away the money that he had. I like what the theologian John Stott had to say about this. He said, it would be cynical to suppose that Felix's only motive was to hold Paul to ransom. I think he knew that Paul had something more precious than money, something which money cannot buy. The truth of the gospel is spoken by Paul is provoking and alarming to Felix. Now, it's, it's worth quickly pointing out that the coming judgment that Paul speaks about here in verse 25 is synonymous with the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And I wonder if in particular, it's the resurrection that brings about the most alarm and fear in Felix. Now, self-control and righteousness Maybe he was uh, feeling convicted by those. Maybe he did feel convicted by his sin and separation before God. But the idea of coming judgment, the truth that Felix would one day be resurrected and would have to account for what he had done before God, now that is alarming to any person, especially one like Felix. And yet it seems to persist on him. He comes back to it again and again for two years. But tragically, we see no evidence that Felix ever responded to it. Seemingly, he rejects this truth. It's a tragic ending. Now, I can actually really resonate with Felix. I think I understand how he feels. I spent many years of my life knowing the truth of the gospel, being exposed to it regularly, and yet I rejected it. The reason I rejected it was because I desired other things in my heart over this truth, contrary to this truth. And so again, I understand Felix here. For him, I think it was greed and money that that clouded his vision, that clouded his heart. 
And this line that he has, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. That is exactly what I was saying in my heart. And another day passes and another, a week, a month, a year, multiple years, rejecting this truth that I knew deep down in my heart. And looking back on it now, I can see that my heart yearned for this. But I was saying, go away, God. When it's convenient for me, I will call on you. And by the grace of God, he called me back. Through a lot of revelation of my sin and difficult conversations, he called me back. And I'm so thankful. And he's calling all of us. Some of you here might want to keep your distance from this. It's just too uncomfortable. Maybe you'll come back to it another time. And I, I get that. I've been there. Or it's like my physio exercises. You know it's, it's this truth that you need. You know you need to give it an honest effort. But you've just got other priorities right now. And you'll, you'll maybe come back to it later. It's not the right time. And so maybe you're looking at these two characters. On the one hand, you have Paul who sees the truth of the gospel and he responds to it and he's willing to sacrifice for it. And on the other hand, you have Felix who seems to be living in fear of it. And there's this in-between response that you might have in your mind where you say, well, I don't really want either of those things. What I can just do is I can just ignore it. Now, unfortunately, there's a flaw in that plan. It's only a temporary solution. And this is my third point, response to the resurrection. Richard Dawkins, it's maybe a name some of you know, he's one of the most influential atheists of all time, a very renowned scientist. Um, he's getting quite old now. He's still alive, but he's 82 years old. And I was watching an interview with him recently, and they asked him pretty openly about his age and his inevitable death. You know, how did he feel about it? And this is what he had to say. If there's something frightening about being dead, it is the idea of eternity. Whether it's before you're born or after you're born, it's a frightening idea. And so the best way to spend eternity, therefore, is under a general anesthetic, which is exactly what is going to happen. So Richard Dawkins says that when we die, we just go into eternal numbness. We go into eternal nothingness. Now, while he may claim to have found peace with that, I think a lot of us would find that immensely troubling, immensely disturbing. We long for there to be more after this life. We want to believe in it, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. If you've ever been to a funeral, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we want to know also that there is decisive justice beyond this life for all the terrible things that have happened, for all the evil that's been perpetrated. Now, while Richard Dawkins might say that this is foolish or a fantasy, just because we want it doesn't make it true, and I agree with that. As Christians, we believe that we were wired this way. Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that God has put eternity into man's heart. And Paul, in this passage, sees this as a crucial point. In the passage, despite his miserable situation that he has every right to try and fight his way out of, Paul seems intent on making the resurrection of the dead a focal point of his discussions. He refers to it three times in verse 15, 21, and 25. Twice in his trial, and then once when he is speaking with Felix and Drusilla. And so Paul's reference to the resurrection is not just him pushing his audience to wrestle with the reality of life after death. It's not him just pushing this existential question on us. It's him making a point about the resurrection of Jesus. He is pointing to the resurrection of Jesus. And this is where it's worth saying that as Christians, we are Christians because we believe in the resurrection of dead people. And we believe specifically that at one point in history, there was a man who was resurrected from the dead, Jesus Christ. Maybe that's obvious, but, and, and Perch touched on this last, last week, actually, but it's worth revisiting again. The resurrection is at the heart of Christianity. 
It is a historical fact that we believe every person needs to grapple with. If Jesus Christ really was crucified on a cross and buried before many witnesses and raised from the dead and showed himself to over 500 witnesses, as 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, then Jesus' claim as God is true and he is our rightful king. All of us. The resurrection was the central claim of the early Christians, and it's our central claim now as Christians. And back then, they were hated for it. And here's my question. If it was all a lie, why didn't they just disprove it? Why didn't Tertullus and the Jews silence Paul and these Christians once and for all by just disproving the resurrection? And the interesting thing is, they all come from Jerusalem. That's where, the, that's where Jesus died. All the witnesses would be there, and they, most of them would still be alive. Why don't they just disprove it? Because they can't. Because it's true. If Jesus really did resurrect from the dead, then it also authenticates everything that Jesus said. And Jesus did not say that only he would be resurrected. He said that all people would be resurrected. John 5, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of of judgment. So Jesus will come back to deal with the sin in the world. He will deal with these injustices that we all experience. And for many people, that is a great comfort. And this means that we cannot escape the claims of Christianity. We are forced to have a response to the resurrection. Because as it turns out, life itself is persistent. It goes on. This mantra that we just have one life to live, so live it to the fullest, is not true. And this is not just equivalent to ignoring a back problem and failing to do your exercises. This is far more serious than that. So I want to encourage everyone here today to respond in some way to the resurrection. And I want to speak to two groups. First, I want to speak to those here who have not put their faith in Jesus, those who are not Christians. I would encourage you to consider this truth that we proclaim here. Investigate the facts yourself. I I do think you'll be surprised by what you find. Christianity does not ask you to check your brain at the door. God gave you intelligence for a reason, so investigate it. And speak to those who believe it. I speak to you as someone who has personally seen the grace of Jesus Christ and the hope of the resurrection. And this room is filled with people who share that same story. Jesus Christ's resurrection is proof that he can be trusted with your life. He wants a relationship with you. On offer to you is a clear conscience by his grace. That means it's free. And the truth of his desire for you will not uh, not cease. It will persist until the resurrection of all people. And by the way, you are always welcome in this church. And for those who are Christians, my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ here, we shouldn't look at Paul and simply just desire to persist and, and Uh, tough through the tough times like he did. That's not what we're talking about. We should look at Paul and take note of the thing that so moved his heart that he would respond in such a way. Is what Paul believes not what we also believe? I think when life gets nasty, we oftentimes try to just grit and bear it, and we just wear this banner of Christ and act like life is just supposed to be better. I think it's like we're running this grueling race of life and it's painful we're tired it's hot and humid all the other runners are stepping on our toes and bumping into us and we're doing the same thing to them and we think that if we just take our normal running t-shirt off and we put on the running t-shirt that says i'm a christian and we just run harder that it'll all be better but what actually makes the race easier is knowing why you are running and what you are running towards. 
and to know you are not running it alone. Paul understood this. Jesus died for your sins. He will resurrect you into eternal life with him, and he is present with you now through his spirit. And I want to close with one final thought. Jesus was in the exact same position as Paul 20 years earlier. He sat in a court before the Roman governor of his time, Pontius Pilate, accused, falsely accused, and he remained silent. He went to his death without any defense. Why did he do that? He did that so that we, like Paul, would receive his grace and the hope of his resurrection and be empowered to testify on Christ's behalf. Jesus stayed silent so that we can be persistent in speaking of the resurrection of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning and we just want to acknowledge all the injustice in the world. We have experience injustice as Paul has in all different kinds of ways. And the reality is we've also perpetrated injustices against others as well. And Lord, we want to seek your grace in this moment. We want to seek your grace through the truth of Jesus Christ, what he has done for us. And Lord, I pray that we would see the beauty of what Christ has done for us, that it would move our hearts as it moved Paul's hearts. And I feel, I I pray that the the feeling of, um, the, the, the hope of the resurrection would grip us as it gripped Paul. Lord, won't you encourage us, those who are struggling, those who need the hope of the resurrection, and for those who do not know these things, Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit into their hearts to see clearly, see the power of the resurrection And so, Lord, give us your resurrection courage this morning. Do this for your sake. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.